Hello class. In module 12, we'll be talking about quantitative data analysis. And your book chapters talk a little bit about how we present quantitative data, uh, the proposal, um, the, the book, as you know by now, is a lot about uh, preparing a thesis or a dissertation and the steps that you go through in that process. Um, so feel free to skim over some of those sections that are about proposals, scheduling hearings, defenses, things like that, um, and really focus on the content of the quantitative data analysis, um, the techniques and decisions that we make uh, within that. So um, we're going to talk uh, about some of the statistical analyses specifically. I want to do a quick refresher of the four primary variable types. We talked about this during the instrumentation module, but I want to go over those again quickly because they do matter quite a bit in the statistical analyses and the decisions we make around which analyses to conduct. Nominal data, if you'll remember, um, are uh, data that are used to describe qualitative attributes of individuals. So for example, religion or uh, gender, sexual orientation or identity. Um, Special cases of nominal data are dichotomous variables. Um, those are nominal variables in which there are only two values, typically assigned one and two or zero and one. Uh, an example of this would be pregnant or not pregnant. Um, it's a dichotomous variable in which there can only be those two values. Ordinal data is uh, sometimes considered categorical data, um, and these values exist along a continuum of low to high in terms of the numbers assigned, but the distance between those values is not necessarily equal. Um, and so, for example, on a scale of one to seven, how much do you enjoy sex? Uh, one might be, I don't enjoy sex at all, and seven might be, I love sex more than life itself. Um, probably not what we'd actually ask on a scale, but you get the idea. Um, so the distance between the values, it's not necessarily equal. So the distance between 1 and 2 may not be the same as the distance between 6 and 7 or 4 and 5. Um, and so the, they don't necessarily represent um, exact numbers or exact values, um, but they give us a sense of some sort of a continuum of low to high. Interval data, these values also exist along a continuum of low to high, but the distance between those values is equal. Um, and in interval data, there's no absolute zero point. So a common example that we use to talk about interval data is temperature. So temperature in Fahrenheit or Celsius, uh, in which zero doesn't really have a meaning. So zero degrees Fahrenheit doesn't mean that there is no temperature. There's an absence of temperature. Um, it is an actual reading. Um, so there's no absolute zero point in terms of there being an absence of that variable um, or of that characteristic. Ratio level data, on the other hand, is interval level data with an absolute zero point. So for example, number of sexual risk acts, zero has a meaning in that it means the complete absence of sexual risk behavior or sexual risk acts. Um, often we talk about interval data and ratio level data as continuous data. Um, and nominal data is often categorical. Ordinal can go uh, either way, depending on how we're slicing that up. Uh, one more thing that I will review quickly before we get into the meat of things is the difference between independent and dependent variables. You should have a pretty good sense of this by now, but it's worth a quick refresher. Independent variables in experimental research are the factors that we manipulate. So for example, intervention conditions, um, intervention versus control condition, um, components of the intervention. In non-experimental research, these are variables that we examine um, as predictors of other variables, like gender when we're comparing groups, or um, individual characteristics like self-esteem as a predictor of uh, sexual anxiety, for example. And the dependent variable, um, or what's often called outcome variables, particularly in non-experimental research, are variables that we think may depend on our independent variables. And as I mentioned uh, earlier, some variables can never be dependent variables, such as biological sex or sex at birth, um, or race or ethnicity. Um, we wouldn't ever say self-esteem predicts uh, whether or not someone is white or black. Um, that cannot actually depend on any other variable. So 
quick refresher for independent dependent variables for the kinds of variables. Um, and now let's move on into the meat. Um, so just a quick note as we head into the rest of this lecture, I know that uh, people have a lot of anxiety around statistics. Um, we're going to cover some really basic conceptual ideas around statistics. So we're not going to run any statistics. We're not going to run any analyses. I'm not going to have you interpret anything. I want you to get the basic ideas of what these analyses do um, and, and kind of uh, conceptually why we run analyses, why we do statistical analyses. So statistics in their most basic form are mathematical tools that we use to organize, summarize, and manipulate data. Um, and manipulate, by manipulate I don't mean, you know, change the answers and lie about it. Uh, I mean that we use um, to work data around, uh, to change the, the nature of certain variables, um, things like that. And we talk about two primary statistical applications. One is descriptive statistics, in which we describe or summarize typically individual variables. And the other is inferential statistics. And inferential statistics are used to make an inference about the characteristic of a population based on data from a sample of that population. So we want to say maybe here's the mean that we got in the sample. And we want to try and say, uh, is that mean a good approximation of the, what the mean is in the full population of people that our sample represents? Um, inferential statistics are also used most commonly to uh, test hypotheses. And so these are answering research questions about associations between variables, differences between groups, um, predictors, things like this. Uh, this is what we most often think of when we think about statistics, uh, our statistical analyses, is actually posing a research question, creating a hypothesis for that research question, and then testing it um, to see if there is support for that hypothesis. So I'll talk a little bit about descriptive statistics uh, and then move on into inferential statistics. Descriptive statistics uh, are things like percentages, means, standard deviations, uh, things like that. We do we run different kinds of descriptive statistics for different kinds of variables. So again, here is where the kind of variable that we have matters a lot in the kinds of analyses that we run. So if there is categorical data versus continuous data is often what we um, use to talk about the kinds of variables that we have. Categorical data are typically uh, nominal variables, sometimes ordinal variables. Um, continuous data are interval or ratio, ratio variables and sometimes some amalgamation of or, ordinal variables. So for example, when we have an ordinal, uh, a set of ordinal variables, for example, um, the one that I gave the example of uh, on one of the last slides was how much do you enjoy sex on a scale of one to seven. And so if we have a scale of, let's say, sexual satisfaction, and there are 15 items that each have a five point scale from strongly disagree to strongly agree, those individual variables are actually ordinal variables. Um, but what we typically do is create a sum score, or in some cases an average score, of all of those items on that scale, and we get a total score that is then a continuous variable that does become then um, an interval or a ratio variable depending on how that's scored. So, um, so those ordinal variables sometimes can sort of transform um, into continuous uh, interval or ratio variables. But typically when we're talking about categorical data, we're talking about nominal and ordinal variables. Continuous data, we're talking about interval or ratio variables. And so when we want to report descriptive statistics on categorical data, we're often reporting sample sizes uh, and percentages. So for example, we might say in total 52% of the sample, and we would tell how many people 52% of the sample is, indicated that they had received the HPV vaccine. Um, and that is uh, that would typically be a yes or no question. Have you in your life received the HPV vaccine? Yes or no? That might be coded zero or one or one or two. Um, and that would be a nominal variable. And then we would report the percentage of that variable. That's the descriptive statistic that we would use. In continuous data, we would report typically the means, the standard deviations, medians, modes, and ranges. Uh, 
This may vary a little bit according to what kind of continuous data that we have um, and uh, what that data looks like. So for example, we might say in the full sample, sexual anxiety scores ranged from 1 to 4 with a mean score of 2.53 and a standard deviation of 0.73. And so when we talk about inferential statistics, we're often uh, looking at the role of statistical significance. And so I want to take a little bit of time to talk about statistical significance and what that means. So inferential statistics are designed uh, to detect significant statistical significance uh, differences or associations that did not occur by chance. And so significance, or a p-value, is essentially the probability of obtaining a sample statistic, so whatever statistic, um, whatever result we get from a t-test or a correlation or whatever, um, that will make more sense in a second and probably makes a bit more sense if you've already read the chapter. Um, and so though that value, that p-value, varies between 0 and 1 and is always a positive value. Um, in most analyses and in social sciences more generally, psychology, uh, sociology, things like that, we use a standard of p is less than 0.05. Um, and basically what we're saying is that we have, uh, we're willing to accept a 5% chance of being wrong <laughs> or of saying that there is a significant difference or association when there really isn't one uh, in the population. We could also use uh, 0.10, which some people call marginally significant. Um, and people will often also report P is less than 0.01 or 0.001. Um, and that just tells us that we have a bit more certainty that we're not wrong. And so let's talk a little bit more about what statistical significance means. Um, we talked a little bit in the last slide, I talked a little bit in the last slide about the probability uh, of obtaining a sample statistic. Um, and so when we say that p is less than 0.05, we often say p is less than 0.05, so there, uh, it, there is a statistically significant difference or association or prediction. And what we're essentially saying is there's less than a 5% probability that our results are due to chance. And there's more than 95% probability that the effect that you found, the difference or the association or whatever that statistic is that you found in your sample, actually exists in the population, actually exists in the world, um, or is real uh, and not due to chance. And so I often, uh, and I probably have said this before, um, I want people to really think about eliminating the word prove from your vocabulary. Um, when we run uh, statistical analyses, when we do research, um, we're never saying that this research proves that there is a difference between men and women or that there is an association between um, sexual satisfaction and sexual anxiety. Uh, we're saying we're, we're pretty sure that there is an association um, in this sample and that there, um, the association in this sample is probably true in the world. Um, so I think it's important to think about what statistical significance means. Um, this is something that statisticians and social scientists have been using for a long time. Uh, there is increasingly some conversation about thinking a little bit more carefully about what p-values mean um, and how we will interpret them. I'm not going to go into that. If some of you are super interested in that, I can post. Uh, there is a position paper from the American, Psych American Sociological Association that I can post about um, what p-values mean and how we interpret them and how we use them. Um, but for our purposes, statistical significance, uh, the sort of bottom end or the minimum statistical significance that we accept to call something statistically significant is 0.05. Um, and that indicates statistical significance. But it doesn't necessarily mean that our findings are important. So when we're working with large samples, big national data sets, uh, big samples that we've collected, 
even very small differences or very small associations or effects might actually be statistically significant. Um, the value of that test statistic, and we won't get into the details of why this is true, but the value of that test statistic is related to the sample size. So the larger the n or the sample size, the greater the value of that test statistic and the more likely that it will be uh, declared statistically significant. And so we have to think about, you know, if we have a sample of 2,000 people, um, we'll have a lot of things, a lot of associations, a lot of differences, uh, a lot of tests that are statistically significant. But we then have to think about how large that difference or association is, uh, what we often refer to as an effect size. And um, if that effect size is very small, then we might say this is statistically significant, but there's a very small difference, or there's a very small effect. And so we have to think then about how important or meaningful that is. So how does that difference, or what does that difference um, or association mean for clinical practice, for education, for therapy? Uh, does that difference or association depend um, uh, or does that importance uh, or does the, the implication um, depend on why that difference or association might exist? We want to think about why we found what we did, what direction it's in, uh, whether or not it's specific to a kind of people or to a context or perhaps a methodology, and think about how it fits within the existing literature. Um, so, uh, for example, in some large data sets, they may say uh, there is a statistically significant difference in sexual satisfaction scores between men and women. Uh, the mean score for men is 3.5, the mean score for women is 3. So there is um, a difference in the mean scores of about 0.5. Is that an important difference? Even if it's statistically significant, it will depend on some degree to how large that scale is. So if the scale goes from one to four, then a 0.5 uh, difference might uh, actually be something that we want to attend to and think a little bit more about. Um, if the scale is larger, maybe less so. Uh, if that is a difference that is um, not something we typically find in the literature, we might want to pay more attention to that. But we always want to think about not just is something statistically significant, um, but how big that difference or association is, and then what does that mean? And the suggested reading that is listed on the syllabus talks about a few different kinds of ways of thinking about significance, so clinical, practical, uh, and statistical significance, and how we think about how those um, are different and might overlap. So I'll move into thinking a little bit more specifically about the specific statistical tests uh, that we use and how we choose those. Um, I, as I've said multiple times, we're always going back to our research question. Um, the variables that we are using in our research question can always be recoded and examined in a variety of different ways. Not always, often can be recoded and examined in a variety of ways. Um, and there might be multiple ways to answer um, a research question. So we're often uh, making decisions all along the way here about how to phrase our research question, how to answer that, how to slice our variables, um, and how to look at these different things. So the variable types, again, are key uh, in making decisions about the kinds of statistical analyses that we want to use. Most stats books, uh, most um, most online things that you search will have these kinds of flowcharts that will help you make decisions. Uh, your book doesn't have this flowchart, but it has a table for you on page 261. Uh, there is table 12.2 that has some commonly used uh, statistical tests and also gives you a sense of the kinds of variables that are in each of those tests, the statistic that you get, and the purpose of those tests. Um, and this uh, is a flowchart that gives you some sense of how to make that decision. And so again, this comes back to the level of the measurement. And so this starts with our dependent variable. And so is it nominal or ordinal versus interval or ratio? And then we look at the level of the variable of the independent variable or predictor. Is that categorical or continuous? Um, and then depending on what we decide there, there are a series of uh, analyses that might be most appropriate um, for that. And as you see here, this particular flowchart doesn't lead you exactly to one um, analysis. It gives you a few different options. So you still have to make decisions 
within these kinds of flowcharts. So what I'm going to do next is talk a little bit about uh, a few common statistical techniques. I'm not going to go through all of them in the table uh, because it's a lot and it's more than you need to know. I'm going to go through some of the basics that you'll encounter a lot when you are reading the research literature. So the first is a Pearson correlation. Uh, this is the uh, fourth one down in your um, table 12.2, the Pearson product correlation. Um, there are a few different other kinds of correlations. The Spearman row at the very bottom of this table um, is another one that looks at correlations between ordinal variables rather than correlations between interval or ratio variables, but we're going to focus for our purposes on the Pearson correlation, which examines associations between two or more interval or ratio variables. The value of that correlation, the R statistic that you get, ranges from negative one to positive one. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit about what those, uh, what the negative versus a positive correlation means. So an example of a statistic that you might read using a Pearson correlation is uh, the following. An analysis of 510 college women found a significant positive correlation between relationship satisfaction and sexual satisfaction. And so we see uh, hear this R statistic telling people what statistic it is that we're using. This is the sample size in this situation. And this is this R value, 0.69. So you'll see that it's somewhere in between this negative one and positive one, closer to a positive one here. And it is statistically significant. P in this situation is less than 0 0.0001. Um, I made up all of these examples, uh, so these are not actual examples, although certainly plausible, um, and I think most uh, research does find a positive correlation between relationship satisfaction and sexual satisfaction. And what this means by a positive correlation, what we can tell from this statistic is that as relationship satisfaction increases, sexual satisfaction also increases. If we were to find a negative correlation, if this were to be R, equals negative 0.69, what we would conclude is that as relationship satisfaction increases, sexual satisfaction decreases, so that those variables move in an opposite direction when there is a negative correlation. In this situation, it's a positive correlation, and so we know that these variables move in the same direction. As one increases, the other one also increases. As one decreases, the other one also decreases. A key piece of this, which I'm sure you uh, have probably encountered this phrase before, is that correlation does not equal causation. So one of the significant things, one of the most important things that we, um, important limitations that we want to talk about from this particular analysis is that we can't say in the situation higher levels of relationship satisfaction cause higher levels of se sexual satisfaction. We also can't say that higher levels of sexual satisfaction cause higher levels of relationship satisfaction. Um, we don't know which variable causes which uh, other variable in this situation. Um, in some situations like this, we talk about one as an independent variable and the other as a dependent variable, um, but uh, often we don't necessarily know uh, what what direction this causation is moving in. And in a situation like this, probably what's happening is that there, there is some sort of a reciprocal relationship here such that the happier or more satisfied we are in our relationships, the better um, our sex lives are, the more satisfied we are with our sex lives, and the more satisfied we are with our sex lives, the more satisfied we are with our relationships. Um, so that is uh, the basic idea behind correlation. Um, T-tests are probably something that you've encountered in some of the research that you've read so far as well. We'll talk about two different kinds of T-tests. One is independent samples t-tests, which examine the difference between the means of two independent groups. So these are um, in t-tests for independent samples, you have a nominal independent variable, so a categorical independent variable. Um, and that categorical independent variable um, can only have two different groups in there and an interval or a ratio dependent variable. An example of a use of a t-test might be something like the following. Among college students, women scored higher than men in sexual anxiety. And what I've presented here in these parentheses is the mean for women, 
3.92 on this scale of sexual anxiety. Um, and the sexual anxiety scale is four different items that are measured on uh, an ordinal Likert scale. So um, one being a, a very low level of sexual anxiety, four being a very high level of sexual anxiety. Um, and you create a summed score using those four variables. So women had an average score of 3.92, men had an average score of 2.01, and if you compare those two means, what you see here, this is your t-statistic, um, this is your degrees of freedom, don't worry about that at all right now, but this is the statistic that you're interested in, 1.92. And what we see here is that P is in fact less than 0.05. And so there is a statistically significant difference in sexual anxiety between men and women. Um, again, this is a situation in which we can talk about is this difference meaningful or not. Uh, this is pretty close to, um, to twice this value. There are about two, um, whereas women are closer to four. So uh, that actually might be both a statistically significant and a meaningful difference if you want to think about sexual anxiety and gender differences in sexual anxiety. Dependent samples t-tests, on the other hand, examine within group differences. So the same group of people on the same score measured twice. So um, this would be an example uh, th that we often do independent, uh, dependent samples t-tests in would be a pretest, post-test difference. So this is from an example um, from a study that I did. Uh, where I looked at expressive writing and I had men come in and write about their deepest uh, and um, their deepest and, and most intense feelings about being gay uh, in the world. And so we measured sexual compulsivity. We measured a whole host of things at the baseline and then a whole bunch of things two months after they did that writing exercise. Um, again, these are not actual numbers, although the difference here was statistically significant in the actual study. So in a sample of gay and bisexual men who completed an expressive writing intervention, sexual compulsivity scores were significantly lower at the follow-up assessment compared to the baseline assessment. And again, here we see mean scores. So mean sexual compulsivity at baseline was 27.22. Mean sexual compulsivity scores at the follow-up were 21.35. Um, this is telling us that our t-statistic and our degrees of freedom here, which again, don't worry about, our t-statistic is 2.39, and p is less than 0.01. So we have a statistically significant difference. And again, we want to think about whether or not that's important. Uh, we could calculate an effect size that would tell us a little bit about how, um, how much of an effect uh, there is. Um, but this does tell us that there's a statistically significant difference between the pretest uh, or the pre experimental and the post experimental scores. Chi squares are uh, an analysis that are used that's used when you have two nominal variables, so two categorical variables. And the chi square test examines differences in proportions between two nominal variables. So, for example, among heterosexual men, those who met diagnostic criteria for sexual compulsivity were more likely than those who did not meet criteria for sexual compulsivity to also meet criteria for clinical depression. And so what this tells us is uh, if we say 20% um, of men in the sample met criteria for sexual compulsivity, 80% did not, 40% uh, of the men in the sample met criteria for clinical depression, 60% did not. And then we want to look at the overlap, essentially. Um, and what we would, what we would want to be looking for is to see if more of those guys who met criteria for sexual compulsivity um, also met criteria for depression. And what this analysis tells us here, this tells us that this is the chi-square statistic. Um, this is the degrees of freedom. Again, don't worry about that. This is the chi-square value, and this tells us that P is significant at less than 0.01. Um, and so what we do see is there is a statistically significant difference in uh, the way that these proportions shake out. Um, so more of the guys who meet criteria for sexual compulsivity also meet criteria for clinical depression. We'll talk about uh, two more analyses. One is an ANOVA, 
Um, all the analyses that we've looked at so far basically have two variables in there. So Pearson correlation examines a correlation between two variables. There are situations in which we can do more variables, but we're just talking about a situation in which we're looking at two variables. Uh, t-test examines um, two variables in the independent samples t-test and two scores in the dep dependent samples t-test. A chi-square examines differences in proportion between two nominal variables. And now when we come to an ANOVA, we're actually looking at uh, the differences in means between three or more nominal groups. Um, so we still have these two variables in here, the scores on some continuous or interval or ratio level outcome variable. Um, but the independent variable here uh, is a nominal variable, a categorical variable, but there's more than two groups. So um, this is similar in a lot of ways to an independent samples t-test, but you only have two independent groups here. In an ANOVA, you can have three or more independent groups. So an example of this might be something like the following. Individuals who reported adherence to a Christian religious tradition reported higher levels of sexual anxiety than those who reported adherence to a non-Christian religious tradition and also reported higher levels of sexual anxiety than those who reported no religious affiliation. I'll give you a second to process all of that. That's a very long sentence. Basically what we see here when we look at um, what I've presented to you in terms of the statistics, uh, the mean level of sexual anxiety for those who are Christian is 4.22. The mean level of sexual anxiety for those who um, are religious but of a non-Christian religious tradition is 3.21. And for those who are not religious at all or report no religious affiliation, their mean is 1.91. And what this tells us, uh, this ANOVA statistic, this is an F statistic, uh, and this is the statistic that we're, the number that we're actually looking at. And again, this is statistically significant because I'm only showing you things that are significant in these um, examples. What this tells us is that there's some difference among these three variables. In an ANOVA, when you find a significant, what's called an omnibus F test, you would want to um, run a series of what are called post hoc analyses. And those post hoc analyses would tell you if the diff statistically significant differences between this one and this one, between this one and this one, or between 4.22 and 1.91. Um, and the difference may be in multiple places. We may find that there's actually only a difference between those who are uh, of a Christian religious tradition and those who aren't religious at all. Um, there may also be a difference between those who are of some um, non-Christian religious tradition and those who aren't religious at all, but that there isn't a difference between those who are Christian and non-Christian. Um, that might be what we end up finding out when we do a, a finer grain of analysis. The last analysis I'll talk about is regression. I'm going to talk about bivariate or multiple regression. Um, your book also, uh, I think, um, talks a little bit maybe about um, logistic regression. I, I don't think it does actually in the, um, in the uh, table. But regression is one that you'll commonly see in a lot of the articles that you read. And regression is very similar to correlation. Um, the, the basic math behind a regression analysis is the same as the math in a Pearson correlation. Uh, regression analyses examine the predictive power of a variable or a set of variables on a continuous outcome variable. And so, for example, results indicated that a history of sexual assault predicted the number of drinks reported in one's most recent sexual encounter. And this gives us a beta value. And again, I made it so that this was significant because I made it up, so why not? Um, and so uh, this does a very similar thing uh, in a lot of ways to a regression analysis, but it uh, does it slightly differently so that we can talk about the role um, of one variable as a predictor of another variable. Um, and we may or may not be able to talk about causation. It depends on whether or not we've measured things longitudinally. So did we measure uh, sexual assault um, earlier in a, in, a, in a baseline assessment, for example, and then measured number of drinks reported in one's most recent sexual encounter um, later on? 
theoretically, some history of sexual assault had to have happened uh, prior to one's most recent sexual encounter, assuming one's most recent sexual encounter was not assault. Um, and so we can talk uh, a little bit more conceptually about the possibility of causation uh, when we're looking at regression analyses. Um, so these are some basic analyses that you'll run into in uh, a lot of the papers that you'll read. So hopefully um, this will help you make a little bit more sense of what those analyses mean and what we can take away from them and the kinds of decisions that you need to think about um, as you're deciding what analyses to run. Um, I don't want you to get too bogged down in the details of this at this level of research methods. Um, I'm not going to ask you to run analyses. Uh, the, um, the quiz has some pretty basic components of statistical analyses in there as questions um, that you'll be able to, to understand based on both the lecture and reading the text. Um, so particularly for those of you who feel a lot of anxiety around statistics, uh, don't get too bogged down in these. So I'll end up uh, with, again, a question of what does it all mean? So um, even if we find a statistically significant difference, association, predictor, I always want you to be coming back to your research question um, and thinking about why that difference or association uh, exists. Is it specific to your sample, to the kinds of people that you're looking at, to the methodology? How does it fit within existing literature? Um, and then what do we do? with that information? How do we utilize that information um, to move forward? So um, I think that was a lot. Uh, hopefully that helped you get a little bit of a better sense of quantitative data analysis. For those of you who are in the PhD program and will be continuing on, um, you'll get much, much more of this in 850 um, and specifically in 851. If you have questions, if you have thoughts, if you're confused about anything, please, please reach out to me, post under the general discussion forum, um, and I can try and clarify for you. Uh, but otherwise, that's it for quantitative data analysis.